Good morning and welcome to this uh, fifth lecture in uh, this year's lecture series uh, with Dr. Kelly Kapik on a theology of Christian life. Uh, a warm welcome to you if uh, particularly this is uh, your uh, first uh, lecture and uh, you're very welcome. We're glad to have you uh, with us. Welcome to you if you're watching uh, online. Uh, if you have been here for these lectures, you'll uh, have heard a uh, or experienced a rich feast as we've considered how the Christian life is uh, really a response to the love of God. And we've thought uh, deeply, Kelly's helped us to think deeply about what it means uh, for God to love us, what it means for us to participate uh, in that love. And uh, yesterday, we thought in particular about the love uh, seen in Christ the mediator. And we thought about how uh, Jesus is, uh, is God, but is a human, became a human being in the incarnation. And we are reconciled by his death, and we are saved by his uh, life. And so uh, it's been uh, wonderful for us to reflect deeply on the Christian life theologically. That's what Kelly's been uh, doing for us, uh, helping us to think theologically about uh, the Christian life. And uh, I'm very uh, much looking forward to uh, this morning's lecture. Just a few uh, pieces of uh, housekeeping. Um, uh, Kelly, again, very graciously is uh, happy to answer questions, which will uh, occur through the Slido app. And I think the Slido code is there. So if you haven't used Slido before, you can download uh, the app. Or you can just use the QR code, and then you can enter the um, uh, today's uh, code, um, which is um, the uh, uh, today's date. So uh, we'll have an opportunity uh, at the end uh, to deal with those questions. And during the talk, you can uh, enter your questions, and you can also kind of uh, vote on questions that you uh, particularly would like to uh, to have answered. Uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, of the lecture and questions, uh, there'll be uh, morning tea uh, just over to uh, your right. Uh, let me uh, read uh, the Bible and then pray, and then we'll welcome Kelly uh, to speak. So I'm going to read uh, a passage from Ephesians and then two passages from Romans. Uh, Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And Romans 5 from verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then over to Romans 8 and verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Let's pray. You did not receive the spirit of slavery 
to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Our Father, we do thank you for the gift of your spirit. Uh, We thank you that as we receive the spirit, we uh, experience the wonderful blessings of adoption and sonship, and we call you Father. We thank you for the wonderful privilege of that uh, family relationship that as we live the Christian life, uh, we are not on our own. Uh, We have your spirit. Uh, We know your son, and we call you Father. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please uh, join with me in welcoming uh, Kelly. Good morning. You can't tell, but I'm wearing jeans today. We're slowly making it, and those of you who will quickly not pay attention, here's something for you to focus on. You can wager on this. How long will the jacket stay on? (laughs) So I decided not to take it off immediately, just so you can kind of stay engaged at some point. I can't spell, and so I often tell my students, just look for the misspellings on the, war, on the board, and it makes them feel better about themselves. So maybe, maybe something like that. I'm excited as we've been really spending this week thinking about a theology of Christian life as really an extended meditation on the Pauline benediction that we are resting in this benediction of the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're spending all these hours really thinking about. And today we will be talking about this idea of fellowship, entering into the life and love of God by his spirit. Please pray with me. Our Father, we thank you that you have not left us in our sin and our rebellion, but out of your love you sent your Son and poured out your spirit that you might bring life and love where there is sin and death, that you might bring reconciliation where there was enmity, that you might bring laughter where there were tears, that you might bring feast where there was famine. We speak often of your spirit, but would you provoke our hearts this morning to praise as we concentrate on the beauty and glory of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of the risen King. Amen. So I want to start with this question. What changes? What changes? When a person becomes a Christian, a strange thing happens. Some of you maybe are recently converted, and we'll think through this. When someone becomes a Christian, a strange thing happens. What I mean by that is nothing changes. Nothing actually changes. If you were struggling financially before your conversion, your financial woes do not instantly disappear. If you were previously divorced, the new believer does not awake to find themselves happily married. If you're living under an oppressive government regime, you are not straight away taken into a land of liberty. And so on the surface of things, nothing changes for the person who becomes a Christian. However, as you know, the great promise of Scripture is that on the one hand, while nothing changes, on the other hand, everything changes. Everything changes. And in order to understand these changes, we are going to spend this morning thinking about God's Spirit in us and how he transforms us in the present, even in the midst of our pain, frustration, and struggles in life. What is God doing with us, and how do his love and grace shape this Christian life? So let's start by talking about God's present action. God's present action. How is it that we experience God's love and life now? Where is that thing? Oh, here it is. You introduced me to this yesterday. I just realized, why is my neck hurting? 
apparently I'm very fragile. I'm from California, so. Uh, how is it that we experience God's love and life now? Think about this. Given that we're talking about Jesus who lived, right, 2,000 years ago. That's how we think of it, right? He, this man living 2,000 years ago in the Middle Eastern world, you know, how, how does it, how does his perfect life of obedience and his role, as I was talking about yesterday, as the lead worshiper, how does that benefit me and you? Really, do we end up thinking that Jesus was just a really amazing example of God's love? Was he just a beautiful picture of human faithfulness that we're meant to be encouraged by? Like, wow, look at Jesus. That, that really was, he was inspirational. Or maybe this infiltrates some of, you know, this setting like my setting. We are a the theological institutions, and so we really care about learning. But is Christianity primarily an act of memory? where we study and learn about the past, especially about Jesus, so that his life can inspire us? Does that connection have something more to it? The truth is Jesus certainly lived an exceptional life, and by many people, including non-Christians, has been kind of this revered model that others could emulate. But I'm sure you know Orthodox Christianity believes something far more than historical recollection is important, more than just inspiration for believers. Jesus of Nazareth is certainly a historical figure, but the Christian faith never merely consists in an intellectual affirmation about something that happened in the ancient Near Eastern world, nor is it simply that Jesus is this model citizen who provides this historical challenge for us today, nor is it that Jesus just long ago solved an accounting problem and he dealt with some things and so he could move enough chips into our favor, into our side of the ledger. No, the Christian faith has always centered on trust, fiducia, in a person, this this one in whom we're brought into a new relationship, this God-man, Jesus, the Messiah, the mediator that we focused on yesterday. In other words, it involves both receiving and responding, not simply recall. That is all prefatory in terms of saying, how do Christ's person and work benefit us today and animate us in our Christian life? And the short answer is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Our experience of being drawn into the fellowship, into fellowship with God is the action of the Spirit, God's Spirit, working in our spirits, enabling us to recognize Him as our Father. The Holy Spirit, who's none other than the Spirit of Christ, is the way that Jesus is with us in John 14. The work of Jesus in the past changes who we are even now. And we experience that reality by his work in us through his spirit. Secured by the spirit, we now enjoy all the benefits of being in God's family and participating in fellowship of the Trinity. This brings this renewed fellowship with God, the benefits of forgiveness, reconciliation, joy, and holiness, this new life comes to us as fruit of the Spirit's presence and renewing power. The Spirit's presence and renewing power. The Spirit draws us, as we've been talking about, into this communion with God as he applies the very work of Christ to our lives that we might rest secure in the Father's benediction. We then are drenched afresh in this overflow of the triune God's life-giving love. The spirit of creation, as I keep saying, I keep telling you the God of creation is the same as the God of recreation. Never forget the spirit of creation who hovers over the waters, over the kerek tohu vohu, this, the spirit in Genesis 1 is the same spirit who hovers over Mary, is the same spirit who brings life to us out of our death. 
And in this, to borrow from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the Spirit renews us, as it says, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And by the way, given some questions yesterday, notice the confession, 17th century confession says, renew us in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, and with dominion over the creatures. There is this recognition that somehow, even in this new creation in us by the Spirit, it still has larger creational significance of some kind animating and ordering, which is the very work of the Spirit, enabling us to enjoy and foster communion with God, neighbor, and rest of creation. That's the path of love. That is the inbreaking of shalom. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to focus on a few points, <clears throat> and I'll just warn you, I've already gotten a taste of it, the first bit is the more difficult. <clears throat> You've kind of gotten used to some of that. We're going to have to do some hard work. We're going to think of carefully about some Trinitarian ideas but I promise there is pastoral significance, and more of it will be clear in the later part of the talk. So first, I want to think through how, as the bond of love between the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is also the bond of love between God and us. Just as the Spirit is the bond of love between the Father and the Son, the Spirit is the bond of love between God and us. We'll talk more about that. Secondly, we'll talk about how the benefits of Christ become ours by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, how the Spirit, and I really want to think through this in light of some of the things we've talked about, the Spirit connects us with the cross and the resurrection. With the cross and the resurrection. And then with the remaining time, I want to at least give some hints at a reading of Romans 8, talking a bit about the flesh and the spirit of dying to live and about hope. Let's jump in. Observation one, as the bond, here we go, <clears throat> as the bond, oh, look at that, what's, what's service? Um, observation one, as the bond of love between the Father and the Son, the person of the Holy Spirit is also the bond of love between God and us. You may be unfamiliar with this language, which I've been introducing to you, it's a very strong Augustinian tradition, way of understanding and reading the scriptures here, but the idea is the Holy Spirit's place in the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father, this love is none other than the Spirit. This love between the Father and Son is not merely sentiment, it's actually none other than the Holy Spirit. Personal, a person, the Spirit fully God. But the Spirit is not the Father. The Spirit is not the Son. And so this Augustinian conclusion, the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, this bond is a person himself, not merely an attribute of God, but truly God. This Augustinian structure of the, the lover, the beloved, and the love between them. And I want us to start to think through this a bit more, especially in light of the Spirit today. In John 14... Verses 16 and 17, you may remember, <clears throat> oh, I was just thinking about this. Maybe, let, me, let me put this in your, your heads. A good exercise for you, if you've been thinking about these talks this week and in the future, would be to read the Upper Room Discourse over and over again for a while. It's fascinating because it's very common for even Christians to go like, I know the Trinity is supposed to matter. I know we're supposed to affirm it. I'm not actually sure why it matters. It doesn't really seem practical. It doesn't seem pastoral. It should, it should be of great significance to us as Jesus prepares his disciples for his coming death, resurrection, and ascension. Read the Upper Room Discourse. It is all Trinitarian theology. This is the very life of our faith. This is what makes us Christian. <clears throat> and notice the strong emphasis he gives us on the Spirit. So as he promises his disciples that he will not leave them alone, we read this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may be with you for a bit of time. Is that what he says? No, no, no. That he will be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. 
the Father, God, as God in heaven, the, who sent the incarnate Son, and who here the promise is of sending the Spirit at Pentecost. The Son of God, the Son as God in front of us, the Logos, who faithfully conforms his being and actions to the words and nature of the Father, the Spirit as God within us, all three one God, each God in his completeness, yet each in a way that God's relationship to us reflects his very being in himself. I know this gets tough, but it's important for us to realize there's one God, and that one God is in three persons, and each person is distinguished by their specific relations to the others. The Father begets the Son. The Son proceeds from the Father, and those of us in the West commonly affirm, and I would, from the Father and from the Son. The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten but not made, the Spirit is eternally proceeding. I know that gets heavy, the eyes glaze over, but hang with me a little bit here because this is very important. It guards against the idea that we have three deities. Uh, part of the challenge is when we hear the word person in our world, in this, you know, in English, we're not talking about hypostases, we're not, we're not, it's hard for us not to imagine, especially in light of our individualism stuff, when we talk about persons, we think autonomous, individual, separate things. And if that's the imagery and understanding we bring to the idea of divine persons, it's, it's amazing we can be quoting the creed but unintentionally ending up with tritheism because they did not mean three autonomous beings. There's one being, Yahweh, worthy of worship, who is eternally Father, Son, and Spirit. The living God is the one God who wills from the Father through the Son and by the Spirit, not three persons who each have an independent autonomous will, but each expresses the one being of God, and therefore each wills the one will of God, because each person is God. I know that's tough, but I want to draw here on Basil of Caesarea. Some of you know this early Cappadocian father, very important, and wrote one of the earliest, most important volumes on the Holy Spirit. His dates are 330 to 379. And when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, he uses this language. He says, the Holy Spirit is indivisibly and inseparably joined to the Father and the Son. The Spirit is indivisibly and inseparably joined to the Father and the Son. And it's from this that the tradition speaks of, maybe you've heard of this phrase, the the inseparable operations of the divine persons, inseparable operations of divine persons. But if this is the first time you've heard that phrase, you can be forgiven for misunderstanding it. It sounds when you, when you say the inseparable operations, it sounds like you're collapsing the divine persons. If you say they're inseparable, it doesn't mean they're, you can't distinguish them. But that was never actually the point. This idea of inseparable operations was meant to guide the church's liturgy, to guide the church's praise, that are praises to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. That is the one God we worship. And so Basel, what he's saying here is that the work, this is his language, the work of the Father is not separate or distinct from the Son. No, 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 the Father does not become incarnate. But there is no incarnation apart from the, the Son and the Spirit, or from the Father and the Spirit. Just as the Son, not the Spirit of the Father, is incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, so the Spirit, and not the Son of the Father, is poured out at Pentecost. The Spirit is God Himself working throughout creation in and on people to bring them into communion with the risen Christ who reigns and rules at the Father's right hand. So some of you have heard maybe this, this, it's often, I don't know why we do this, we make certain phrases Latin, 
It's kind of like Imago Dei. Like, why, why do we do that? That's not even the language of Scripture. But anyways, we make it Latin. We're like, Imago Dei. We don't say image of God. But, well, th- this opera, Trinitatis ad extra sunt indivisia. Have you ever heard of that? Anyways. Well, you should, because it, it, you've got to get something out of all this tuition you're paying, right? <laughs> but the ink, what you need to know is the external works. Remember, we've talked about the ad extra and the ad intra. The external works of the triune God are undivided. The external works of the triune God are undivided. This does not undermine personal distinctions in God, but grounds them in the unity of action and being. I'm not going to be talking about this, but there's an amazing sermon that Augustine gives. I think it's Sermon 52. It's on Jesus' baptism where he talks about this very thing and says, somehow we need to affirm this and yet also recognize the sun and the water, the spirit recognizes the dove and the voice of the Father. We need to recognize distinction, but this indivisibility is to say, who saves? God saves. Right? A sign that this goes wrong, I think I alluded to this the other day, is if you start to think the son really loves you and the father's just angry all the time. We cannot pit the persons of the Trinity against one another. Similarly, by the way, it becomes a problem if it's Jesus really wants everyone to be redeemed, but the spirit is reluctant. These are, I mean, that's a loaded theological debate and we'd have to talk through that, but I'm just telling you, Anytime you start to think, oh, are we pitting the persons of the Trinity against one another? Ding, 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 red light, be very nervous. There's one God who is eternally Father, Son, and Spirit, and there is never a divide. You never pit the persons against one another. And so back to to Basel of Caesarea, where he talks about what he calls the transmission of the will in the Godhead where he says, and again, this is in the 4th century, he says, it's not a movement from a greater, as he says, to a subordinate or lesser, but, in his language, like the, I I think this is really helpful, because it's so hard to think through. He says, but it's like the reflection of an object in a mirror, which reaches from the Father to the Son, but without the passage of time. Right? The Son is eternally begotten. There's no beginning in the Son. The Son is always eternally in relation to the Father. Like this mirror, no passage in time. And so I want to read you this, this bit of a paragraph from, from Basel because he's talking about the, how does God create angels, right? But this will give you a sense of this Trinitarian way of trying to think through this. Here's what he says. When you consider creation, he's talking to, you know, potential ministers and future, and he says, when you consider the crea- creation, I advise you, to first think of him who is the first cause of everything that exists, namely the Father, and then of the Son who is the Creator, and then the Holy Spirit, the Perfector. So the ministering spirits exist by the will of the Father, are brought into being by the work of the Son, and are perfected by the presence of the Spirit. He goes on, let no one accuse me of saying that there are three unoriginate persons, because that would be three gods, or that the work of the Son is imperfect. No, no, no. The originator of all things is one. He creates through the Son and perfects through or by the Spirit. What Basel and the ancient church is trying to get at, biblically, is to make sure we don't end up with a god behind the gods. Sometimes we can talk as if the Father is a, you know, the person of the Father, person of the Son, person of the Spirit, but but really God is something else behind them. No, 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 no. This one deity lives in three relations. There is no disunity. There is no conflict in the Trinity. That would compromise the Shema Israel, right? In Deuteronomy 6.4. The distinct divine persons do not constitute, as you would argue, an ontological hierarchy, but they do reveal the one God who's relationally, he relationally has otherness in himself. These relations, as Giles Emery says, 
are identical to the very being of God. They're identified with the essence of God, which is pure existence. These relations subsist. In other words, God eternally subsists in three relations, Father, Son, and Spirit. There is no God who is not the divine persons. So that even before, as we talked about that first time, or second lecture on love, even before there was anything ad extra, anything outside of God, it is proper to say that God is love. Now, all of that hard work was necessary to more fully appreciate this part of the Pauline benediction, where he says, he mentions the fellowship or the koinonia of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to think through this more. How can we say both How can we say these two things? How can we say that the triune God is love and that the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son? It sounds very strange. How can you say both that the triune God is love and that the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son? So I want to tease this out a little bit. Peter Lombard, medieval theologian, 1100 to 1160, he navigates this very question, drawing heavily upon Augustine, where he also describes the Spirit as the love or the charity or the affection of the Father and the Son. But by that, if you read him unpacking, it's not that the Spirit is an attribute. The Spirit is none other than a person, distinct from the Father and Son, but the very embodiment. And the question, though, is how is this compatible with if, if the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, or the Spirit is love, how is that compatible with John's statement that God is love? And what Peter Lombard and Augustine and others will argue is you actually find in Scripture this kind of pattern where you can speak of wisdom, the wisdom of God generally. God is wise, the very wisdom of God. And yet you can recognize that the Scriptures also speak, as I'm sure you know, of the logos of God as wisdom personified. Like wisdom and this is Lombard, in the Trinity, love is sometimes ascribed to the substance, God, which is common to the three persons and entire in each of them, and sometimes especially to the person of the Spirit. Now, I, know, I think we're most familiar, because we've even been focusing on it, this Johannine claim that God is love. I think it's less obvious to us, this link the Spirit has with love. So I want us to think through this. So uh, John says, Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, Peter Lombard recognizes this twofold dynamic. I I like how he puts this very simply. Love is God from God. I want you to think that. Love is God from God. Love is God from God. Not only is God love, but but love comes from God. And the love from God is nothing short of God. God is love. Let me just make sure. I've been talking a lot about love this week. And particularly in our kind of Western culture, well, not just Western, but in Western culture, we tend to have reduced love to sentimentality, to maybe a warm feeling. And so when we talk about God as love and experiencing the love of God, are we merely talking about sentimentality? Are we merely talking about getting some kind of warm feeling in you? And I want you to know that Christian tradition has said much more than that. Much more than that. Now, so if God is love... How do we think through this, that we receive God's love? And the argument is that the Father, it can't be the Father, the Father alone cannot come from God, biblically, in terms of the grammar of Scripture. The Father alone cannot come from God, so love must come and point to the Son and or the Spirit. But but it actually does to both divine persons in such a way that it's distinctive to each. John comments that because God is love, as you know, we ought to love in response to having first been loved. And this love of God 
is first manifest in this way in the sending of the Son. Right? The Son is love incarnate, as John says, to be a propitiation for our sins. But for our purpose today, also notice this love comes with the indwelling of the Spirit that John says in chapter 4, verse 13, 1 John 4, 13, the sin of the Spirit who has been given to us. The Son is both the embodiment and object of divine love, but the Scriptures also dis- point to distinctive ways that this is true of the Spirit. First, make sure you're with me. How do we know that we abide in God and God in us? Biblically, what's the answer? How do we know that we abide in God and God in us? By what? By his Spirit, right? We know that God abides in us and, he, and we in him by his Spirit. Now, the this next question is, And what is the evidence of the Spirit's dwelling in us? How well you do on your doctrine test. No, as you know, John says, the evidence of the Spirit's indwelling is love. Out of love, the Father sends the Son as the embodiment and object of divine love, and then the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son as the very presence and power of this divine love. Thus enlivening, we talk about being born again by the Spirit, enlivening, animating, sustaining believers by bringing us into the koinonia of God, bringing us into fellowship with God. There's this basic principle that the ad extra, the external work, always in some way must relate to the ad intra, the very internal being of God. In other words, God's self-revelation really tells us something about God, about God's self. In this case, the strong claim that God's abiding in us and us in God is love, this is, this is actualized in us by the very presence of the Spirit. Again, Lombard, and I'm almost done with Lombard. I know, medievals, we don't, I don't know why, but we don't think they matter anymore but if the gates of hell will never prevail, the church didn't end like in 90 AD or 300 AD and start again in 1517. We have to value the whole church even as we critique. Anyways, Lombard says, the Holy Spirit is the love of the Father and Son by which, we, by which they love themselves mutually and us, but also the love by which we love God. Did you catch that? How do we, who were at once at enmity with God, to use Paul's language, how do we, how are we able to love God? And the answer is because we've received his spirit, who's brought life where there was death, that we might then be made alive by God's grace and love, and thus enter into this love and respond to God in love. He connects our love for God and this Holy Spirit who is love. The primary emphasis is God's own internal Trinitarian love and God's love for us, but then there are implications for our responsive love for God that is dependent on the Spirit as well. As Augustine says, it is the Holy Spirit by which he has given to us that makes us abide in God and him in us. And this is precisely what love does. He then is the gift of God who is love. And the gift is the Holy Spirit. Observation number two, I promise the rest are shorter. But observation two, the benefits of the grace of Christ become ours by the Holy Spirit. I mentioned before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus, in this expectation-setting scene in the upper room, starts to talk. And you'll remember there he says that all that the Father has is mine, and he's going to take what is mine and declare it to you in John 16. This prompts them and us to ask, how is this conveyed to believers in such a way that it truly becomes ours? And as you know, the answer is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth will draw people to him who is... Let me pause again. 
We say the spirit is the spirit of truth, right? So, I mean, that's biblical. This may not be a thing here, but kind of in America, there's been this thing like the truth project and this kind of thing and that kind of thing. And as Christians, rightly are trying to engage in culture and think through things. But one of the problems with some of that is sometimes the idea is, well, Christians, because we have the Holy Spirit and the Spirit is the Spirit of truth, that must mean we actually know everything. We must have the best answers for all the economic problems. We must have the best ideas for this or for that or this and that. And the idea is, well, the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Well, I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, the Spirit came to dwell in me, I still could not do any chemistry to save my life. I remember in uni the last class in mathematics I took, which, by the way, I don't know why, you know, Legos, why do you call it maths? We're going to have to talk, people. So, anyways, but the spirit, so why, is, when, we, when John says the spirit is the spirit of truth, is that, oh, you're a Christian, you get to know everything. No, no, no. When it, biblically, what it means is the spirit is the spirit of truth because he points you to him who is the truth, Christ. The spirit will always take you into truth, not abstract ideas, but to him who is the truth, to Jesus, the Messiah. So in this scene, the Spirit draws us to him who is the truth, not by bringing a different or a new message, but both by being God and showing them God in John 16, 13. Some of you know, may know the name. He's no longer living, but the Dutch New Testament scholar Herman Ritterboss. Ritterboss, reflecting on this, the Spirit here in this passage, speaks, and this is kind of interesting just because we don't, you know, yesterday my whole talk was on Jesus as the unique mediator, which I 100% believe. But he says there is a sense in which in this passage the Spirit is a kind of, as he says, mediator. Because the Spirit unites us to the incarnate Son and enables us to enjoy the gifts of God. The Spirit takes, as he says, takes what is mine, bringing forth the very treasure entrusted to Jesus in order to redistribute it in his way. Ritterboss says here, the Spirit is, quote, the permanent mediator between Jesus and those who belong to Jesus. The Spirit is the permanent mediator between Jesus and those who belong to Jesus. He doesn't mean, he's not trying to replace Jesus as the mediator between God and man, kind of First Timothy, no, no, no. But the idea is the Spirit, it's not, as a mediator here, it's not the Spirit keeping us from Jesus, but the Spirit is the living and active link to Jesus, right? While it is through Christ that we have access unto the Father, that access, as Paul says in Ephesians 2.18, is by one Spirit. From the beginning, our new life as adopted children of God, all that we have comes from Christ, or comes through Christ from the Father by the Spirit, God our Father, Christ our elder brother, all true and kept by the Spirit. So that all the riches of God's love are made known and secured in the grace of Christ, and they become ours. Remember, I was asking, how, how do we benefit? They become ours by this fellowship, by this koinonia. The Spirit takes all that is the Father's, all that is the Son's, and gives it to God's people. We receive God by His Spirit. And this God gives us Himself even now. The Spirit brings us into fellowship both with God and with His people. The bond of love between the Father and the Son is the bond of love between God and us. He is this, he is, as you know, the paraclete who dwells in us, God fully present to us by the Spirit. This one God is the giver, the given, and the gift. The Father is the giver who sends the Son. The Son is given as the external reality of God's self-revelation to us, and the Spirit is this internal reality of that revelation. We respond to God by his gift as he is given, in order that we might love the giver. Not three gods, but one God who gives himself to us, 
Father, Son, and Spirit. As we said the other day, all things are from him, through him, and to him. God is God is love, and all three persons of God are love. We cannot say only the Spirit is love. That would be wrong. It is not that the Spirit alone is love, but we can say, we must say, as Paul says, that God's love has been poured into our hearts. How? Through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. This emphasizes one particular action without denying the others. As the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, comes to us and draws us into the life and love of God. All right, let's jump to number three. The Spirit connects us to the cross and resurrection. The Spirit connects us to the cross and the resurrection. The love of God and the grace of Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit. This is not, we've got to be careful because this has sometimes happened, as if God the Father is maybe just linked with love and the Son just with grace and the Spirit with fellowship, as if the Spirit is not love or as if the Father is not gracious. No, no, no. God is love in all three ways of him being God, God eternally being God as Father, Son, and Spirit. God shows us his grace most clearly in the incarnation, taking our flesh to himself. And God's communion, which is love in its activity and loving, is God himself, the Holy Spirit, reaching into our hearts to join him. All right, let me now try and get a little more practical, because I know this has been heavy and fast. One of my concerns here is that we confuse the fruit for the root. We confuse the fruit for the root. What I mean by that is when you think about incarnation and Pentecost, sometimes it can creep unintentionally into our preaching that we convey in a way that the incarnation or cross, incarnation I'm using to represent the full life, death, resurrection of Christ, the incarnation or Pentecost are the things that make God love us. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ascension, beloved, are not, are not what convinced the Father to love us. Rather, he embodies the Father's love for us, as John 3.16 always reminds us. And these events come about because of that love. The Spirit's work in us is not what makes God pay attention to us. The Spirit is God himself in us, taking care of us because he loves us. When we confuse the root with the fruit, you understand the idea is the incarnation and Pentecost are the fruit of God's love, not what makes God love us. If we don't get that, it distorts our image of the Father and harms the Christian life. As I said, we can never pit the persons of the Trinity against one another. This one God is worthy of worship, the Father saving us through the Son and by the Spirit. In joy and thankfulness, we praise him. We talk, if we had more time, to really unpack this idea of union with Christ. We are united to Christ. As he says, if anyone loves me, you will follow my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our dwelling with them are dwelling with them. In the middle of this talk about the Holy Spirit, Jesus makes it clear that even after he ascends, he will be with his people by the Spirit. This phrase, in Christ, shows up over 150 times in the New Testament. I'm very thankful in the last about 15 years there's been renewed interest in this idea of... um, of union with Christ, and so I'm not going to unpack all of that now, but I do want to bring up these two points. First, thanks to the Spirit, Christians are not mere antiquarians. Thanks to the Spirit, Christians are not mere antiquarians. The Spirit is not simply reminding us of things that happened in the past, right? The Spirit actually connects us to the crucified and risen Lord. So this means, second then, that the Spirit connects Christians to Christ in all of his work, both in the cross and the empty tomb. I think I alluded to this the other day, but part of my concern is when we preach Christ and him crucified, but we lose everything else that Paul and others are talking about, we can miss it. 
You understand that for Paul, the cross is shorthand for God's great defeat of the great enemies of sin, death, and the devil. So that apart from Christ's death, our sin condemns us, the devil accuses us, and death would still have a hold over us. But in our place, Jesus Jesus faced these enemies, absorbing and then silencing the judgment, the darkness, and the accusation, defeating death itself, so that as the church has often said through the ages, sin is actually nailed to the cross. But... Paul doesn't just said, say you've been crucified with Christ. He also says you've been raised with Christ. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, but he was also buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas. Then the 12, it goes on. And if there was no resurrection from the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised, and our preaching is in vain. This matters... The sign that we're only preaching the cross and not the resurrection is, as I think I was hinting at the other day, we only focus on the forgiveness of sins, which is good news. That's glorious news. But we don't then focus on the life that God has given us by his spirit. Right? The spirit, remember? This is a reason why the spirit, we talk about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and truth. The point is not just that you will be forgiven. The point is that the God of creation is renewing his work in and through you by his spirit. And so we proclaim Christ crucified and risen, and we have a message for Christians, not simply your sins are forgiven, don't miss, not less than your sins are forgiven, but also that he has good work for you to do. And you do that not not just trying to be like Jesus, not not self-improvement, but because the spirit of the risen Christ now dwells in us. This isn't, if we speak the gospel only in terms of an event that happened a long time ago with no expectation of God's present power and action in us, and here I am a Presbyterian, I'm preaching against myself, sometimes we can be accused of not believing in the presence and power of the Spirit. And the the honest truth is sometimes that hits close to home. No, 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 no. We need to not have an underdeveloped appreciation of the presence and work of the Spirit. God's work is in us. He does not stop with forgiveness, but daily brings us into fresh communion with God, allows us by His Spirit to love the unlovable. The Spirit connects us not simply to a past death, but to a present life. All right, let me use the rest of the time to make a few reflections on Romans 8. The first is just the flesh and the Spirit. I alluded to this a little bit the other day. But Paul tells us to walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, But as I said, that is not, when you read Paul, and this this has crept into the history of the church often, where we confuse this, and we think this is material or physical versus non-material. And you can see that happening when the church starts to belittle or undervalue the material world. But when Paul is talking about the flesh and the spirit, he's not talking about physicality versus non-physicality. Life in the flesh is that which is focused on the self, on rebellion, on idolatry. Life in the Spirit is characterized by freedom before God. Biblically, that freedom is always freedom from sin and freedom to love others. I remember years ago um, being involved with a group and the, it, it, uh, seminarians, basically, and new pastors, and they, many of them coming from very fundamentalist backgrounds, and they had gotten into Reformed theology, and they had learned about the beauty of the freedom of the Christian. And so there was a conference, and outside, you know, there was a group of these uh, young folks, and they were all, you know, at a pub, and, and, you know, drinking heartily, and I'm not against alcohol, for the record, but they were drinking heartily, everyone had cigars and all that, and, I, and, and it was all these jokes about freedom in, in Christ. And I thought, you don't get it. 
Whether or not you drink alcohol, that's a different discussion. But the freedom of the Christian is not fundamentally about can you drink alcohol and smoke cigars? The freedom of the Christian is you're finally free to not be self-absorbed. You're finally free to love others even when it costs you. It is not fundamentally about all these things you can finally do. It is that you've been freed by the love of God that you might, out of that love, love others. Whether you smoke cigars or drink a beer, that's a different conversation. But if you reduce Christian freedom to that, you've fundamentally misunderstood and even distorted the whole thing. You, however, as Paul says, are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. This takes me to the next point, dying to live. The ongoing work of the spirit in God's children. John Calvin, in his treatment of Romans 8, used this language you may have heard of called vivification and mortification. Vivificatio, mortificatio, right? I don't know, again, you know, one of these things. And I want to unpack these for you, but Philip Melanchthon, the great uh, Lutheran theologian, writing the very first systematic the theology of the Reformation, used this very idea as the life of repentance. So I want to take a minute because I think this is of huge pastoral significance to you and can help you understand when we talk about the presence and power of the Spirit in our lives. Mortificatio and vivificatio. Mortification and vivification. Mortification is this idea of putting things to death. I would say often when it comes to our vision of the Christian life, this tends to be the only thing many of us Christians focus on. The idea is to put sin to death, which I think is good and right. But we have an underdeveloped idea of vivification. Let me use some concrete examples to help you know what I mean. I work with college students, so that often influences my illustrations here. Well, okay, in a workplace. I will find sometimes that a Christian, say a Christian man, will tell their small group, say, you know, there's this woman at work and I find myself having inappropriate thoughts about her. And so these Christian, uh, this Christian community will tell that young man, say, well, here's what you should do. If she has lunch at 12 with other people, you wait and you have lunch at 1245. And if she, she walks this side of the office, you walk that side of the office. Now, let's be clear. If he does these things, and he moves from having inappropriate thoughts to not having inappropriate thoughts. Is that, a, is that a good thing? Yeah, I think that's a good thing. There's a sense in which that's mortificatio. My problem is when that becomes the vision of the Christian life, it has distorted things. The Christian vision, do you see what's happened there? We have, out of good intentions, we have unintentionally communicated to this person, the goal is for you to make her non-existent. See how problem that is, especially this is a... Beloved, the Christian vision is not simply that you will stop being lustful. The Christian vision is that you will start to see this person made in the very image of God, that you will seek their good and their rightness and glory. And if they're a Christian, that they are your sister in Christ. The goal is not that you will ignore them, but you will get to the point where you seek their good. If you have a roommate and they drive you mad, or maybe there's someone in one of your classes here, and you, when, when you think about them, it's hard for you not to just instantly slander or mock them. Is the goal merely that you will stop mocking them? No, no, no. The goal is not just mortification, the goal is vivification, that by God's Spirit, you will be taken to the place where you seek their good, you seek their upbuilding, that you have the very eyes by God's Spirit to see the beauty that is there and to seek their encouragement, to seek their protection, to seek their good, to seek what you can learn from them and that your life is impoverished without them. The Spirit works not just helping us put sin to death, but vivifying us, 
making us alive. And I fear, especially in my reform world, the Christian life is reduced to death. Beloved, it's not just mortificatio, it's vivificatio. We are called to live. Finally, hope. Hope, confidence that God is in us. We toil and struggle, not in our own strength, but as Paul says in Colossians 1, with all his energy that he powerfully works within us. God's spirit changes us, and he who began a good work will carry it to completion. The promise and fulfillment in Romans 8 is that we who have received the spirit of adoption enables us to cry out to God as our Father. But we realize this yet-to-be-realized nature of adoption. I didn't mean to tell you this, but whatever, this will help. So I remember when we were in California for, for a time, and I heard this story, and it was very helpful to me to think through, but there was a, a family that adopted a child who I think he was eight, nine, something like that. And they, this Christian family had adopted this child, and things were going along, and then one day the mom was in this child's bedroom and was straightening up the bed and noticed there was a sandwich under the pillow. She kind of got irritated, like, come on, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the bed? That's how, what a man. And then started looking around and started to find food hidden all around the room. And then she realized what was happening. This child that had lived as an orphan was just preparing to be abandoned again. And they told that son, Go ahead, keep hiding food, but you don't have to. We will not let you go. And beloved, we are daughters and sons of God now, even though we do not yet fully experience and realize it, but we will not be left as orphans. No, no, no. The spirit whom Christ has sent points us to the Lord reigning in heaven, whose love is immeasurable, whose heavenly intercession is unceasing. This love is the very basis, as Paul describes, of predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. Christian hope, and this is so important, Christian hope is not the absence of pain. It is, Christian hope is the presence of God's spirit. Even as it looks toward what we patiently wait for. We cannot fully see the future, but by the Spirit, we can see him who is the future, the risen Christ. And his Spirit is even with us now. He enables us to pray in the midst of our confusion, fear, and grief. He takes your prayers when you can't even come up with words to say and makes them beautiful incense. We are safe in God's love because Christ has rescued us and given us his spirit. Secure in the fellowship of the spirit of Christ, we are confident that God will not let us go. We could talk about how the spirit convicts and comforts, but let me conclude. God the Holy Spirit brings us into communion with God by the grace whose name is Jesus the Christ, so that we might enjoy the Father's love. The Spirit is love. The Spirit is God, the very love shared between the Father and Son and yet distinguished from them. The Spirit is God's love set free in our hearts, not simply that we can resist temptation, but so that we might actively love and serve others. The Spirit embeds us as a living participant in the very motions and movements of God's love. And in this way, we bear witness to shalom breaking into this present world. Beloved, we worship and adore the Holy Spirit, for he is the Lord and giver of life. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you have not abandoned us, that you did not just do a wonderful thing a long time ago, 
but you were present here, even in Sydney, in 2022. On this day, not just vaguely, but by your spirit present here in this room and even in our hearts. So often our hearts condemn us. We ask for the courage to trust your spirit who testifies with our spirit that we are your children. Lord, you know the people here, you know the particular challenges, the aches, the anger, the sadness, the despair, the bitterness, the fear, the disobedience, the apathetic heart. None of these are too hard for your spirit to work in and through. So bring fresh waves of courage, fresh waves of faith, hope, and love. Bring it to both those who hear and to the one who speaks. It is in the name of our crucified and risen Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Uh, what we might do is just take a couple of minutes, uh, talk to your neighbor, uh, what particularly uh, struck you about the, this uh, talk, or uh, you can perhaps uh, review the Slido questions, add another question, and uh, we'll come back together in a couple of minutes uh, with question time. Okay. Just, uh, just one thing to let you know that really, really uh, helpful questions, too many for us uh, to get through, but. Uh, we're going to collate the questions at the end of the week, and we will um, pass them on uh, to Kelly. So hopefully he, he can review them, and they'll, they'll help as he uh, works on the, uh, the final manuscript for this, uh, this book. But the first question, Kelly, uh, what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? That's a great question. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Because I, I, I think it's a fascinating question because often... To think through that, we have to think through some other things. So I'm not trying to evade the question, but I do want to think about this. So in the 17th century, I, my dissertation was on a Puritan theologian named John Owen. In the 17th century, there were kind of two extremes when he wrote a massive book on the Holy Spirit called Pneumologia. But there were two extremes, what he would have thought of as extremes that he was responding to. One was what you'd call rationalism that had reduced the Holy Spirit to an attribute of God, or, or merely wind or breeze, not actually God himself. That's kind of the problem of rationalism. But the other side, which I think is quite relevant to this question, was what in the 17th century they called enthusiasm. So you've probably heard of Quakers and Shakers, but when we hear that language today, it's very disconnected to its 17th century setting. The reason people were called Quakers and Shakers, it wasn't necessarily a very kind, it was a derogatory term, but it was because they were literally shaking and quaking. And the idea was that was evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence and work. So when, when, we get asked question, when I get asked a question like, what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? I think it's an actually a really good question, especially because even to our day, it's very easy for us, no matter your tradition, to think, well, if you're praying in the Spirit or signs of the Holy Spirit, in order for it to be the Spirit or praying in the Spirit, it's got to be extra. It's got to be really different and supernatural, right? And this is part of my deep concern that goes all the way back to lecture two on love. The God of creation is the same as the God of recreation. The spirit in Genesis 1 who hovers over the chaotic waters to bring order and goodness. The triune God who created us in his image created us with, with a mind, with a will, with affections, with a body. All of those things need to be remembered so that the sign of the spirit's presence should not be that you are losing your mind or your mind is being belittled. The sign of the Spirit should not be that your will is being ignored or downplayed. It should not be that your affections are being downplayed or your bottle, body. No, no, no. The Spirit of creation is the same as the Spirit of recreation. So when we pray, 
part of the way the Spirit works is provoking our minds, bringing people to heart. We pray in light of the Spirit, in light of the Spirit's prayer. But, but we, that engages our mind. The Spirit engages our minds, our wills, our affections. So, and part of that is, if you love me, you keep my commandments. What does that love look like? It looks like commandments. Well, and, and how do you keep his commandments and how do you love? By the Spirit. Well, anyways, all that to say, I think we need to actively depend on the Spirit. And again, I'll pick on, pres- I'll pick on myself as a Presbyterian. I don't know how it is here. For me, quite significant in prayer is learning to actually believe the Spirit is working. And so letting myself wait for the Spirit to bring people to mind and pray, and actually not about praying for a thousand people a day, but really before God, by the Spirit, kind of thinking through them. Sometimes it means I feel like God is encouraging me to send a text of encouragement or word prayer, but often they don't know, but there's something in that. And it's amazing to me how many times now, as this has been going on for a while and it's been really helpful, that someone will say, this is exactly the word I needed right now. Or they will tell me, not knowing, they're pray- not knowing I prayed, that this thing was going on in their life. So that's a lot to say. Whatever prayer is in the Spirit, it's, cr- it's creation affirming, not belittling. But it is also recognizing the Spirit is present when we pray. So let's not just make it a checklist. Let's commune with the Spirit. Anyways, those are some thoughts. Brilliant. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, uh, this is, I, I guess, just sort of picking up something that you uh, touched on in the talk and um, developed, so it's asking a, a little bit more. Uh, th- this question of the, uh, the love between the Father and the Son is the Spirit. How, how do we say that with, without reducing the person of the Spirit to an attribute? And the follow-up question is, what do you mean by the verb is in that, uh, in that yeah. sense? Yeah, good. Um, is is means is. <laughs> it's an excellent question. It's something I have wrestled with a lot about. Um, because the first time when I was introduced to Augustine and thinking through this, when he talked about the Spirit as basically the bond of love between the Father and the Spirit, I, I thought, well, Augustine, you know, I'm, I'm impressive. I was like 24 at the time. I'm like, Augustine's not Trinitarian. How can the spirit be love between the father and the son? That means, no, there's only, that, you only have two persons. And it's taken me a long time to work through it, and it would be a much longer answer, but I would, I would push with this. Part of what we have to stop with and think through first in order to be able to answer that is what do you think the word person means? Now, what we have biblically is we have clear biblical warrant to see that the father is truly God and distinct from the Son and the Spirit. And we see that the Son is not the Father or the Spirit, but passages describe Jesus doing things and and acting in ways that are appropriate only for God, and we, we see him as none other than God. Similarly, the Spirit is distinguished from the Father and the Son, and the Spirit is treated again and again in text in a way that is only appropriate to treat God himself. So from that, our creedal expressions rightly speak of one God, that one God eternally existing in three relations, Father, Son, and Spirit, and the language that we have picked up and used, including now in English with the word person, is a way to actually say there is this distinction within the one Godhead. But the problem with us is I think when we hear the word person, we think autonomous individuals. And the spirit, you find in scripture both psychological analogies and social analogies. The spirit can be the very breath of God, right? Or the spirit can be the dove. You have that distinction. So all that to say, I think biblically we're required to see the spirit himself is God. And the spirit is not the father or the son. 
That is what the tradition's trying to get at. So when we say the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, we don't mean, as long as those things are firm, that the Spirit is a mere attribute of God. That is the danger Owen is responding to on the right with the rationalist. And yet, we should not think of the Spirit as an autonomous, particular, individual person. So the language of person is quite difficult for us, I think, to be able to still be biblically and creedally faithful. Because we have to ask not just what did the creed mean or what did the scriptures mean, because the scriptures don't use that language. We do talk about the Spirit in personal ways, but the Spirit because we think it's right, but we have to ask, what does the scripture mean? What do the creeds mean? And not just assume our current understanding of that language can all be brought in. Because you wanna have all kinds of experience about what a person is, that when we apply it to the Trinity can take us in deeply problematic ways. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, The next question, Uh, some say punishment for sin is separation from God so that at the cross, Jesus was separated from the Father. Uh, John Stott speaks that way in the cross of Christ. Uh, Should we avoid that? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I'm going to tell you an anecdote. First, I'll tell you my short answer, and then I'll unpack it. I don't think we should talk that way. But this is for you students to make you feel better about yourselves when you've done something dumb. So I think I was 20 at the time, maybe 21. I was at Wheaton College as an undergraduate, studying philosophy and history, but had on the side of really getting into Reformed theology and reading all of this stuff. And I worked for the Institute of American Evangelicals. And I had been told that this guy named John Stott was in town speaking to all the graduate students. But the person who was telling me about it said, oh, John Stott, he doesn't even believe in hell. That's all I knew. I had not read a single word of John Stott. So I go up to this thing with hundreds of people. He's he's speaking to the graduates. And his talk is about evangelism and missions. If you know anything about Stott, you know how important that is to him, right? I'm in the back of the room, zealous for the kingdom. And that Q&A, I raise my hand. That's why we don't have rights. Exactly. (laughs) There was no one to protect me from myself. I'll never forget this. This is so, and because he's talking about missions and stuff, it was one of those where you figure a way to make your question a statement, but it's like a question. And and so I I said some version of, and I want you to know this before I disagree with him on this, but I said some version of like, I'm not sure how we can affirm missions and say evangelism really matters if if we don't believe in kind of an eternal judgment or help. And everybody in the room, they're looking at me. And then they all look at him. And this was one of those wonderful, I talked about, Mark gave me a great rebuke. This is John Stott. We didn't even know it. And everyone looks at him, and he just tilted his head. And I could tell there was like a tremble in his voice, and he just said, I don't think we can talk about hell without tears in our eyes. This is just the main thing he said. And then he went on and said, yes, I've wrestled through some of this, and I think here are some passages that kind of make sense with my view, but here are some passages that are difficult with my view, and here, you know, and he just, but I'll never forget that, because I had no tears in my eyes. I just wanted to win an argument, right? It's a great rebuke. Having said that, Stott is not alone. It's become pretty common for people to talk about hell or judgment as a separation from God. And often it, this, this shows up when people talk about on the cross and or in the death of Christ that the Son is separated from God. I would encourage you not to talk that way. I think it is deeply problematic. On the one hand, when we talk about hell as a separation from God, well, this actually could go with Stott's own own view that he had had, but if hell is a separation from God, where is something that where God is not? That's non-existent, right? It, to, probably to be more, honestly, to be more biblically, theologically accurate, it's probably more like hell is the absence of God's common grace, something like that. So, so 
But when it comes to Jesus on the cross and talking about this separation from God, if you have a person of the Trinity separated from God, even for a millisecond, that's not a small problem. You no longer have God. Because God is not three independent beings that one can leave for a while and come back. So actually, I think this quite matters in the tradition because this is where, I don't know where everyone's at in this room on this, but this is where the, the, the tradition, including the reformers, would talk about God can't suffer, but the God who cannot suffer takes on real human flesh. The God who cannot bleed bleeds and dies in Christ. The God who cannot die becomes man that God in Christ by the Spirit can enter into the grave in order to overcome it. The point of the judgment is not that the Son is separated from God, but that God, in and through the incarnate Son, goes into the grave. So as Proverbs says, you know when Proverbs says, like, three things this, four things that? Remember in Proverbs it says, like, uh, three things, I can't remember what, three things are never satisfied. The leech, it's pretty gross, right? The leech never says enough. And the author of Proverbs says, and fire never says enough. And the grave never says enough. The grave is constantly hungry. It can never eat too much. And what we find is that God in Christ, it's not the absence of God. God in Christ enters into death and the grave, and the grave spits him out. Because the God of life in and through the Son enters into death and overcomes it. Praise be to God. That's what I would, that's how I would frame it. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we'll have uh, two more questions. So uh, second last question. If both Old and New Testament people are born of the Spirit, mm. what is the significance of the indwelling Spirit at Pentecost for uh, recreation in us? That is, I think that's such a good question. Um, and I just say, you know, talk to your Old Testament, New Testament scholars. <laughs> there, there is, as you know, like theologically, there's this constant tension we need to affirm between continuity and discontinuity between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. If you, if you go too far in either way, it becomes a problem. So I really do think that the only way people experience new life in God is as the Spirit applies the death of Christ to them, etc. And people will say, well, but Jesus hasn't even died on the cross. But just as for us, his death, looking back, gets applied to us, you can see Old Testament saints, Christ's death being applied to them in the future. I mean, that's not like too hard for God. But it does seem, for Paul and others, it's not that the Spirit isn't active in the Old Testament, but there do seem to be particular promises, like adoption. Um, so I do think there are some of these kind of distinctions um, of both intensification and experientially that, that these promises become more clear um, and more experienced by God's people. But there is, I, I don't want to, you don't want to end up sometimes where the church is like, well, People in the history of church like, the Father is the Old Testament, the Son is the New Testament, and the Spirit is now. No, no, we don't want to do any of that. This is one God working, and so that's not a very satisfying answer, but ask Dan Wu and he'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, final question, uh, Kelly. Um, uh, this questioner, uh, I find your emphasis on mortification over vivification uh, very uh, helpful. Uh, um, as in that we privilege one over the other. Do you have any thoughts as to why we do that? Why do we privilege mortification over vivification? And how do we remedy it? Again, great question. In some ways, I think one of the reasons we focus on mortification and neglect vivification, it corresponds to our focus on cross and neglect of resurrection. I think they go together. And when we emphasize in our preaching and teaching and lives, cross and resurrection, then we will just more naturally think about putting sin to death and being made alive by the Spirit. Um, and so I, I really do think it's so helpful to meditate on 
and think again and again. Like, we never graduate from the fruit of the Spirit. It's not like, well, you know, your first two years or more, focus on the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. Once you're a minister, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Like, no, no, no. This is the sign of the presence and work of God in our lives. So um, I do think it corresponds. I, I want us to be people of cross and resurrection, of death to sin and life to God. And that is, to connect these lectures, that is a right understanding of Christian view of shalom and flourishing. It does help us see this, this nature of we're meant by the Spirit. We are reconnected to love God, love neighbor, rightly relate to the earth, and even get rightly connected in ourselves. Something like that. So. Thank you very much, yep. Kelly. Why don't we uh, show our appreciation? Uh, just a reminder, we have uh, morning tea at now, and uh, for students, uh, classes will uh, recommence at uh, 11.15. Uh, tomorrow is our uh, final lecture, so uh, it'd be great to see uh, everyone back tomorrow. Uh, why don't I uh, pray as we close? Paul writes, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Our Father, we praise you for the gift of the Spirit. Uh, we praise you that through the Spirit, we experience what it means to be your children. Uh, we praise you for his life-giving uh, work in us. And we pray that we would walk by the Spirit to your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.